Ridgecrest. I'm Chantel Oni. I have three minutes to let you know what is happening at our church and how you can get connected. So let's get to it. This is RBC 3. I hope you've made plans for Sunday night, November the 7th at 5 o'clock p.m. right here in our worship center. Our choir and orchestra will lead us in an incredible night of worship, so I hope you will be here. It will also give us an opportunity to recognize our Minister of Music, Tim Willis, for 40 years of wonderful service here at Ridgecrest. You'll hear all of your Ridgecrest favorites, so make plans for November 7th and start inviting your friends as well. The shoe boxes are here, so it is time to start making a profound difference in the life of a child. This is the ministry of Operation Christmas Child, so pick up a shoe box or more before you leave church today and fill those boxes with toys, craft items, and personal care items and bring them back here no later than November 14th. The boxes will be located near the Welcome Center in our main hall. The Samaritan's Purse Ministry will send those boxes around the world to boys and girls in need. Just a few items placed in a shoe box can change the life of someone. So please don't miss this opportunity to make a difference. Finally, Ridgecrest, we want to make sure that connecting with us is simple and efficient. To do that, we've created a number that will allow you to text us. The number is 334-384-8080. Text the word GUEST to receive more information about us. Text the word SERVE to learn how to volunteer with us. And text the word GROUPS to receive more information about our small group ministry here at Ridgecrest. So, Ridgecrest, join us Sunday, November the 7th at 5 o'clock p.m. for a great night of worship. Pick up a shoebox or more for Operation Christmas Child and return it no later than November the 14th. And don't forget to text 334-384-8080 to connect with us. Now you're all caught up. I'm Chantel Oni and family, you've been watching RBC. I don't know about you, but when I hear that clock or see that clock start counting down, I get excited because I know it's time to worship. So let's stand together as we begin our time this morning. Here we go. Ready? Oh, and I.
understanding. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for calling us to worship you. And I pray, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit now that we do that with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Only, Father, by how you've called us here shall we worship you in truth and in spirit. And I pray, Father, that everything that's said and done would bring glory to your name. And, Lord, we ask that you bind the enemy, God, that you keep him from our minds and hearts and all over this campus. And may, Father, we feel the liberty and freedom that only comes from Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated and welcome to Ridgecrest this morning as we worship together, both here in person and in live stream. If you're watching us uh, by live stream, thank you for tuning in, and we welcome you as well. If you would, let us know who you are. You can text us the word guest, G-U-E-S-T, to 334-384-8080. You can do that in the room as well, but we'd love to have you fill out this little tab called Next Steps and bring that to our Welcome Center for those who are our guests today. It's out that door to your left, or just go down the hallway outside and look to your right. We have a gift bag for you. And some information about who we are as a church family, we'd love to share that with you and connect you to a connection group after our worship service. So we'd love to see you there. There's a lot going on today at Ridgecrest. And just a one reminder before Brother Tim comes back, continue to lead us in worship, you'll see this insert in your worship folders. It's about our family fall day. We will begin at 1.30 at Landmark Park and go till 4.30. It's going to be a beautiful afternoon. Uh, no charge. You just go to the guard shack. You let them know that you're from Ridgecrest Baptist Church. You follow the signs and park. And then there's a little, like a ticket booth there before we enter where all the activities are. And that's where you'll get your free food ticket. And uh, Brother Ray has already had his step of approval on those food items this afternoon. It, it is going to, going to be good, so you be sure to come and enjoy the fellowship. There'll be some activities there for as well, but what I enjoy most is just sitting and talking to folks and maybe having a few boiled peanuts and preparing for a ball game maybe that we'll watch this afternoon as Braves. I don't know. Just for those that are Houston Astros fans, we'll be praying for you as well, all right? <laughs> so come, come, if you would, to our fall family, worship, uh, fall family uh, picnic this afternoon from 1.30 to 4.30. Brother Tim, I think that's enough for me. Yes, amen. Let's continue on with our time of praise and worship. Please stand with us.
just, sometimes we get caught up in the emotion of a song, don't we? Music speaks to the heart. You know, the Bible tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. And you know, I see all these people get so excited at the ball games. I watched last night the Braves and things like that, and they're doing the tomahawk chop. And, and they're like, I want to do a tomahawk chop for the Lord, you know? I, He's the only one worthy. We've got it all wrong, folks. We, we've replaced the main thing with something far less. We settle for second best. That's not where God desires for us to be to worship Him. We've got to return to that place where He is first place in all that we say and do and the way that we act. Our world is hungry to see that we are a faithful people to holy God and that He deserves our reverence and our lives. And people are looking for that today. That's what they're searching for. God created within us each a vacuum that only He can fill. But yet so many are trying to fill that vacuum with so many things in the world that leads them to the greater emptiness in their own lives. And it causes them to spiral continually downward to the point to where they feel they can't get up. They've given up. That's not where I am. I'm not going to give up until God calls me home. Because He's got a plan and purpose for all of our lives. I want us to get excited as we worship the Lord. We come into His courts with thanksgiving and praise, thanking Him for being our great God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. All creatures here below. If, if you don't have an attitude of gratitude when you wake up in the morning and thank the Lord for putting your feet on the ground and giving you the ability to take nourishment, to continue on in this life, folks, let me encourage you to do that. Let me encourage you to do that. Let's get back to studying God's Word, allowing Him to speak to us afresh and anew each and every day. We need the Word of God. He's given it to us. It doesn't take anything to open the Word of God and allow Him to speak to us. The problem is our hearts are not attuned to want to spend time with God. we got to get back there. If we're going to see this world change before God returns, we got to get back there. So let's do that. Let's be alike. We represent God You represent God. I am holding on to faith. Because I know you make a way. And I don't always understand. And I don't always get to see. But I believe.
journey of choices taking the path set before us with so much confusion it's so hard to know which road to choose which way to go yet out of the noise and the chaos there is a whisper that rises a voice so familiar a message so clear calling our hearts calming our fears we
All right, take your Bibles and open up to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. While you're doing that, uh, let's say thanks again to our choir and orchestra for helping us worship. We talked about in our staff retreat this week the value and the importance of worship, uh, our hearts being prepared for the Word through worship with song. It's just something about music that does that. Tim quoted, of course, the psalmist who says that uh, the Lord inhabits the praise of His people, and there's a, it's a beautiful idea because uh, in the Hebrew, the idea is that when His people praise Him, He literally comes down out of heaven and sits on their praise. And I was thinking that when you said that, Tim, about how God descends, and it's true, isn't it? When we praise, we sense Him descending in a place, and it's like He sits on the praise, and the idea is, and then he rides that praise. Isn't that cool? And so that's what we get to do when we gather in this place to worship him in the Word. And piggybacking off of what Chuck said, I, I just want to ask you guys, why in the world would we pray for Houston Astros fans? <laughs> Matthew. Well, at, at any rate, hey, I'm glad you're here this morning, and again, our passage today as we continue in this series on what does it mean to follow Jesus is Matthew 11, and we'll read our text in just a moment. Uh, in Kyle Eidelman's book, Not a Fan, many of you read that a few years back. We looked at that in our January book study. He says this, he says, the most literal way to define a follower of Jesus is someone who goes where Jesus goes. He says it's that simple. And then he adds, I'm not sure how you can call yourself a follower of Jesus if you refuse to go where Jesus went. He says, if you follow Jesus, expect yourself to be criticized by some of the religious people in your life. If you follow Jesus, you might find that your family thinks you're crazy. His did. You may find yourself being unfairly accused and unjustly treated by those in political office. He adds, ultimately, if you follow Jesus wherever, you won't just end up covered in his dust, you will end up covered in his blood. Jesus invites us to follow him, but his invitation is on his terms, not on ours. And I want you to see that in the passage that we're going to look at this morning, beginning in verse 27, chapter 11 of Matthew. This is what Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by my father and no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, Father, would you take and illuminate our hearts and our minds this morning with your holy word. Father, we believe it is from you. Our hearts are prepared as we have sung hymns and praises to you. And now, Father, would you take this, your word, would you speak it into our hearts right where we need it? There are people uh, watching by live stream, there are people in this live audience, uh, that, Father, uh, you know what they need from your word. And so empty me of me, fill me up with you, and speak your truth plainly and clearly uh, to all who hear. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart now be acceptable to you and in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, this is one of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament. My guess is that uh, if you've read your Bible very much in life, if you have been to church very much in life, you've heard this passage at least referenced before. If you've been under some stress or some strain at some point in time in your life, you've heard this passage mentioned, come to Jesus, all you who are weary and heavy laden. It's one of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament. It combines comfort uh, for living under His care. It provides information about His provision 
But it also is a, a, a clear and clarion call to his disciples to be a follower that goes far beyond what the religious burdens of life will sometimes impose upon us. Now, you have to understand, when Jesus is writing these words, he's writing it to a people who lived in a religious culture, just like we do today. And uh, this culture was imposing upon them the burdens of the law. There were so many laws uh, that it had, had come forth out of the uh, Old Testament laws, and the Pharisees and the scribes had taken, and they'd multiplied them thousands of times over. There were just so many laws that they burdened people down. You just couldn't keep every th- time you turned somewhere, you were breaking a law or, or you were violating a law. And the Pharisees were always quick to say, oh, there you are, caught you, got you, you broke a law. And the people were burdened down with this religious burden. Jesus even said to the Pharisees, you bind men up with heavy burdens. He was talking about the burdens of the law, and he said, you don't even keep them yourself. But because they were the arbiters of the law, they could say, you're not, but I'm okay. And so Jesus is addressing a people that are are beaten down, trying to, to live for God, and yet they can't because the law keeps condemning them constantly over and over Now, Jesus isn't calling them to give up the law. That's not what he's doing. He's not calling them to do away with the law. What he's calling them is to understand that he has a way uh, to help them live under the law and experience the goodness of God at the same time. And so Jesus offers them, and by extension to us today, he offers an invitation. And it is a refreshing and a rewarding invitation. And it's important for us because there are a lot of Christians today that have uh, reduced their Christian life to trying to do all the right things and not do all the wrong things. And I want to tell you something. Uh, Sooner or later, you're going to be crushed under the weight of that because that's not how you do it. You say, Pastor, you tell us we can go live like we want. No, I'm telling you that Jesus has a better way, and that way is under the power of his Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, do away with the law. He said, I came to fulfill the law. And by the way, he fulfilled it on the cross. And then grace he extended to us to enable us to live not religious lives, but to live lives that are intimately and personally connected to him. And so it's an invitation. That's what he offers them. He says, I have an invitation to you uh, that is new and fresh and different from anything you have experienced. And that's true for us. But that uh, refreshment and reward that comes from accepting the invitation is all about our response. Now, in the Scripture, there are many invitations. In fact, Jesus gave many invitations uh, in the Gospels. In Matthew 4, 19, there is the invitation to the first disciples. And he said uh, to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It was an invitation. In... um, in the scripture, there is the uh, Luke. There is the invitation to the rich young ruler. Perhaps you know that story. Jesus felt love for him and said to him, "There's one thing you like." He said, "I want to follow you." And Jesus said, "Come and follow me, but you've got to do something. Go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor. Then you'll have treasures in heaven. And then come and follow me." That was the invitation to the rich young ruler. That that invitation had a a, a sad ending. There is the invitation to the marriage feast of the Lamb. This is something yet to come. It's extended by Jesus to all who would follow him in Matthew 22, 8 and following, in Revelation 19 and 7. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. There's that feast that's coming down the road. Revelation says that we've been invited to. All those in Christ have been invited to partake of. Then there's the invitation to the church. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in with him, into him and eat with him and he with me. It is an invitation and that is given to the church. Church, what are you going to do? Are you going to, I stand at the door and knock. Will you invite me in? I, I want to come in and have, I want to have fellowship with you. And then there's this invitation in our passage. 
And it's an invitation to anyone that is weary, anyone that is beat down, anyone that is carrying a load, listen, that Jesus never intended for them to carry. That's what this invitation is about. And so this morning, I want to show you three things that Christ's invitation, uh, about Christ's invitation to us. First of all, I want you to see in verse 28, Jesus invites you to show up. Jesus invites you to show up. Verse 28, just the first statement itself, come to me. Those three words, come to me, means Jesus is inviting us to show up. This is what you might say a spiritual RSVP. You're invited, but you must respond because he will not force you to accept the invitation. So he says, come to me, but you have to respond. You have to RSVP. You have to say, I'm coming to Jesus. Who is he talking to specifically? Well, he's talking to all of us in one sense, and then in particular, he's talking to two different Uh, uh, groups of people. He's talking first to the person who is extremely weary. Now come to me, all you who are weary, those who are worn out from the details of life, those who are, are, are worn down from the labor of life. And he's talking about physically, you're just worn out, exhausted from living on life's treadmill. And this is an invitation to bring that external load and give it to Jesus physically to say, I can't, keep, I can't keep up this pace. Have you ever felt like that? There may be some of you here today, and you're on, this is you right here. You are so weary. You are so worn out. Do you know what Jesus wants you to come? Because he promises something we'll look at in just a few minutes, but he promises to give you rest. He promises to give you something that no, uh, uh, no man can give you, no culture can give you, no idea can give you. Only Jesus can give it to you. And he's talking to the person who is weary. Are you weary today? Are you uh, worn out today? I want to remind you that Jesus cares about you physically just as he does spiritually. Jesus cares about you physically. So he's talking to the person that is extremely weary. The second person that he is uh, particularly uh, emphasizing is the person who is extremely burdened. Extremely weary and extremely burdened. Uh, The idea there, you see that that, that, that statement, heavy laden, is the idea of being beaten down, despairing, discouraged, Listen, life is tough. Amen? Amen. Life is tough. And I want to tell you something. If you don't have some supernatural help, it will eventually beat you down. It will lead to despair. It will beat you up. And here, the idea in mind is not just the, the external load, physical load of life. It's the internal, the emotional load of life. And here's what we know. Yeah, if your physical life is out of balance, it affects your emotional life. If your emotional life is out of balance, it affects your physical life, right? And so Jesus is addressing both of those. You're you're discouraged, you're depressed, you're stressed. This is the internal load of life when you're trying to do life without Christ. This is what happens. Eventually, sooner or later, when you're trying to do life without Christ, you're going to get beat down, you're going to get beat up. When you're trying to do life without Christ, listen, you're going to physically get worn out. You see, they're both components are important to Jesus. He cares about you physically. He cares about you spiritually and emotionally. Now, why does the devil want you to live under uh, these kinds of external and internal burdens? Why is that? One's external, physical. One's internal. But they're both burdens, and they can both beat you up. Why does he want you to live that way? Well, simply put, it's because the load external and internal, makes you want to quit, doesn't it? There are people here today, there are people listening to me by live stream and television, and you've been there. Maybe you are there. You want to quit. You want to just, well, we say, throw in the towel. 
I, I can't do this. I can't uh, carry on. And the devil knows that. And so if he senses that you're not going to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to help you live life, and the phrase, the common phrase today is, let's do life. And the devil knows if you don't do life with the Spirit of God, he can make you vulnerable, he can beat you up, he can cause you to want to quit, he can make you compromise and cause you even to yield to temptation. He knows that, he understands that. And so he wants to beat you up. He wants to beat you down. And he uses the external and the internal uh, stresses and burdens of life to do just that. That's why you weren't designed to carry them. And that's what Jesus is talking about here, that he has a better way. Our arch enemy knows that if he can beat us down, then he can beat us up. He knows that. And so Jesus invites us to come to him. He invites us to show up. To the only one who is capable of helping us live and deal with the struggles of life in a broken world. Now, let me tell you three simple ways that you can show up for Jesus. Come to me. Well, first of all, come to him in private prayer and the reading of his word. That's one of the ways that you show up. If you want to, we talked about Wednesday night. By the way, we had a sweet time Wednesday night. The, the Lord just ascended on our place. But we talked about, uh, about the importance of, of, of fortifying our souls. And now more than ever before, listen, there's never been a time you didn't need a fortified soul, but now more than ever. How do you fortify your soul? You show up, you come to Jesus. And, and you come to him in private prayer and in reading his word, reading the scriptures. I was up early this morning reading his word. And by the way, he showed me some new things out of an old song. We, we fortify our soul when we do that. We, we talk to him privately. Another way that you show up to him is you come to him in public worship with other believers. We need this. We need this. We know there's still many people today who are vulnerable to sickness and disease. We get all of that. But I want to tell you something. There's no substitute for gathered worship. There's just no substitute for it. It's what the word means. The ecclesia is a, the gathering. And we gather because it encourages us, and we sing out together, and we encourage one another in the faith. We come to Jesus. Listen, if Jesus rides on the praises of his people, well, it's important to be here where he's riding. Hello? <laughs> to experience that. That's so important for us. And so we come to him. We show up in public worship with other believers. And then third, we come to him in personal obedience and sacrifice. We come in personal obedience and sacrifice. We show up. God, here I am. What do you want? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Uh, God, I'm available to you. I, I show up. I report for duty. Tim says in the mornings we ought, to, we ought to get up and say, God, I'm grateful. We, we ought, it ought to be the first thing out of, thank you, Jesus, I made it through the night. Thank you, praise you. And then listen, you know what you ought to say? And when you get up on your feet, then say, I'm reporting for duty. I'm reporting for duty. What do you have for me today? What do you want for me today? I'm going to tell you something. If you'll start your day with gratitude and you'll report in with your commanding officer and say, what do you want? What is the agenda for the day? Guess what? Your eyes will watch your day differently and you'll see opportunities that you might never have noticed before, opportunities for you both to draw near to Jesus, but also to help Jesus draw near to someone else. And that leads to the second point that I want to show you this morning, and that is not only does Jesus invite you to show up, Jesus invites you in verse 28 to give up. Now you said, now pastor, didn't you start off just a few minutes ago saying that some of you are weary and burdened down and you're ready to quit, to give up? I did. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about quitting. I'm not talking about stopping. I'm talking about a different kind of giving up. Jesus says, come to me, all you. Look at verse 28 again. Keep your Bible open. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Now, implied in our coming to him is that we do something. You know what it is? You ready? It is that we give up control. When Jesus says, come to me, he's not saying, come to me and I'll see if I can work out your problem. Come to me, tell me what's going on, and I'll see how I can, I, I can make it go away. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, come to me, completely give up, completely surrender, completely give up control of your life. And, and giving up control is one of the biggest hindrances to the Spirit-filled life. Amen. See, we, 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 we want the Spirit of God to show up when we need Him, but otherwise we feel pretty competent in ourselves until something causes a crash in our life. And a lot of times we don't even think like that. We're not thinking, I don't want the Spirit, in, but we, our flesh is so strong. It's so powerful. Uh, Paul talked about it in Romans 7. He said, the things that I want to do, I don't seem to be able to do. The things that I, I, I don't want to do or the things I keep on doing, he said, who will deliver me from the body of this death? You know, he's saying, how do I, he said, this flesh thing, he said, it's hard. And then, but he announces, he said, but thank God for the victory in Jesus Christ. You can't do it without Jesus Christ. You can't do it with the, without the Spirit of God operating in you. And our problem is we struggle to give up control because there's something in our flesh that causes us to think, well, I can probably do this better than Jesus. Or Jesus doesn't understand me. I know some people that need to give up control, but Jesus probably doesn't really. I know what I need, and I know what I, 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 I need him to do. We just all struggle giving up control, and it inhibits the power of the Spirit of God from working through us. Listen, uh, when you, after you report for duty, also tell your commander when you get up, you say, not only am I reporting for duty, I give up any right to control my agenda. I give it up. You give me yours. There was an article in Answer Magazine, and it quotes a young woman who made the following statement about following Jesus. She said that she wants to be religious, but isn't prepared to let religion alter her lifestyle. And then I quote, she says, I'm a Jesus girl. But I also like to go out and do tequila shots with my friends. You see, she doesn't understand what it means to follow Jesus. And until a person gets sick and tired of their old life, they won't give it up to follow Jesus. And frankly, that's what Jesus requires. You go back and study the invitations. Remember, I told you about all those different invitations in the gospel. You go back and study those invitations, and here's what you're going to say. Jesus gave the invitation, but he made no provision for them to adjust it. He said, in fact, come and follow me, and well, I've got to do this. He said, well, you're not worthy to follow me. Come and follow me. He said, well, I, I, I need to do this. And then he said, it's okay. Come and, and by the way, uh, when, when he, he tells um, the disciples to follow him, they're fishing. And you remember the story. He says, come. And they, it says immediately they put down their nets. They didn't go. Well, we got to finish cleaning the nets. We got to get this, uh, 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 this uh, a crop of fish. Is it a crop of fish? Y'all don't know either, do you? What would it be? A, a, a nest of fish? A mess of fish. Okay. All right. Uh, just a little footnote here in the message. I like mine better, crop. It's a crop of fish. A mess of fish. They didn't say, hey, we got to deal with these fish first. It says immediately they put down their nets and they followed him. Don't you think they're glad they did? Amen. Nobody who puts his hand to the plow and looks back. I, I, okay, well, I'll go forward. I'll plow on. No. He said, no one. Jesus never extended an invitation and then said, however it works for you. And that's kind of our culture today, isn't it? I'm a Jesus girl, or I'm a Jesus follower, but this and this and this and this are things that I refuse to say, God, it's all yours. 
I'm all yours. Jesus made clear that following him involved self-sacrifice. We just don't like that in this age, do we? We, we don't like that thought. In, in Mark chapter 8, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, listen, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus never compromised what it meant to be a follower of his. Not once. I've mentioned the ruler, the rich young ruler. He didn't compromise. I've told you many times over the years that if that guy had shown up at the average church and said, I'd like to be a follower of Jesus, I have lots of money, I've got good morals, and I've got good manners, we would have said, welcome. But Jesus knew his heart and said, yeah, but you've got a problem. Your heart is not right, and there's something keeping you from following me because no man can serve two masters. He said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and then you come and and follow the invitation. And he went away. It was a sad story. There is a connection. Listen, like it or not, like it or not, if if we could trim it out, and we can't, we would still sooner or later discover that you can't follow Jesus without willing to sac- being willing to sacrifice. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this. I read this as a college student. That was my first uh, encounter with Bonhoeffer in, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. He says, when, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. He bids him come and die. And then he adds, it may be a death Uh, a death like that of the first disciples who had to leave home and work to follow Christ. He said, that may be what it is. He, He says, it may not, but that may be what it is. But he said, cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Cheap grace is grace without the cross. Cheap grace is grace without Jesus Christ uh, being living and incarnate in our lives. And that means giving up control. The fact is, you will never grow up spiritually until you give up yourself to God. You'll never grow up spiritually until you give up yourself. Jesus makes it very clear. So how do we respond to the invitation to give up? Well, let me just say there are a couple of things that we do to respond to that. First of all, we honestly diagnose what controls our time, our treasures, and our talents. I still don't think there's any better way to discover if a person is following Jesus uh, uh, other than measuring these things. Time. What does your schedule say? What controls your time? What controls your treasure? What controls your abilities and your giftedness? Listen, no excuses, no loopholes. Honestly diagnose what controls those things. Those three things tell more about who you are probably in the physical world than anything else. Your time, your treasure, and your talents. No excuses. Be honest. No loopholes. Don't give yourself a pass and then give it to God. That's how you respond to the invitation to give up. Second, you respond by willingly offering the burdens that are controlling your body, your heart, your, your mind. Give it up. What are these burdens? Look, you've got uh, you to honestly acknowledge what controls you, but then you've got to willingly take the burdens. You know, I've seen people, I think, through the years who really w- like carrying their burdens, you know, you know, have you met some people like that and you say, how are you doing? Well, do you, uh, I'll tell you how I'm doing and it's not good. And do you have two hours? I want to tell you about my burdens. And, and they never seem to want to get beyond their burdens. They want to carry them. They just want to carry their burdens. Because, listen, you know what the devil has done? They have convinced them that carrying their burdens is the normal Christian life. Woe is me. Woe is me. And so they begin to believe that that's the normal Christian life. And they carry, they become professional burden toters. They carry their burdens instead of giving them up. That's what Jesus says right here. Come to me, all you who are weary, you're beaten down, you've got burdens, and give those burdens to me. That's what he's saying. So we willingly, we must willingly, if you want to, to, to give up, you've got to give those burdens up. You've got to do it. And you say, well, I gave them up, and I, I found that they showed back up. 
You know what happened? You know, and, and that will happen because the devil doesn't want you to believe that Jesus can deal with them. And so when that happens, guess what you do? This is a shocker. Give it up again. And when it comes back, give it up again. And keep on giving up. Live in the present tense. I am giving it up. I have given it up. And I am continuing to give it up. When it shows back up, I'm going to give it uh, uh, up to Christ. And then third, here's how you respond to the invitation to give up. Consistently stay near Jesus. I, I, th these are not complicated truths, are they? In fact, you say, well, pastor, that's no great revelation. You didn't give us a lot of great revelation. Listen, the greatest counsel that I could give you as a pastor is very simple. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. Keep your eyes on him, and that'll keep your eyes off of you. You know what this world does? It creates ingrown eyeballs. That's scientific, isn't it? Ingrown eyeballs. You know what that is? This world has a way of focusing everything on you. Everything. By the way, that's why we can't settle the victims' rights issues in this culture because everything is about, so you're a victim of this and you're a victim of this and you're a victim of this and if things don't go your way, it's because you're a victim and a victim and a victim and a victim and it doesn't matter. We've got so many victim advocacy groups across this country. We'll never have unity. And I'll tell you what the devil does. He loves it because his strategy, as Jesus says, is to divide so he can conquer. And so he gets us looking inward. Well, somebody, and then you know what he does in the church? He gets the, uh, he gets the believers to say, well, nobody noticed what I did. Or nobody called me and I was sick. We sometimes get that. Bob will get that sometimes as our pastoral care guy. Well, I was sick and nobody called me. I, here's, I, look, listen, let me just say it frankly. We do not have ESP. Now, we have ESPN, <laughs> but we don't have ESP. And so we don't know a lot of times, and, and so people get hurt. So, well, nobody cares. It has nothing to do with care. Sometimes it just has to do with, with knowing. But what happens is we then get our feelings hurt. Not, I, that's just an illustration. There are a hundred things that cause us to turn our eyes inward, and we start looking at ourselves and say, poor me. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't do that? If he had of, he wouldn't have hung on a cross for your sins. So stay near Jesus, keep your eyes on him so you don't develop ingrown eyeballs. And then here's the last thing I want you to see. And this will only take about 40 minutes. <laughs> Verse 29, here's the last thing. Jesus, look, now what are they? Jesus invites you to what class? Number one, to what? Show up, come to me. Number two, Jesus invites you to give up. That is, give your burdens to him. He won't take them off of you. He wants you to give them to him. All right? And then number three, last, Jesus invites you to take up. Verse 29, this is the, this is the I mean, this is just the home run part of the passage. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, the yoke can be either uh, a positive or negative. And it's negative when it describes a yoke of bondage or the yoke of slavery. That's a negative use of this idea of the yoke. But it can be positive. And in this passage, the yoke is positive because it's related to a, a commitment to the master who is a loving master and he cares for those who are carrying a yoke they shouldn't be carrying and has one that they can carry. It's the positive kind of thing. And Jesus is here inviting us to throw off the yoke and the burden imposed on us by the, the stresses and the strains of the world and to take on us the yoke uh, uh, that he has designed, it is a light yoke and it is a comfortable yoke. 
And he wants us to take that yoke upon us. In other words, Jesus invites us to exchange our weary lives for his abundant life for the rest of our life. By the way, that, I use that word rest in two ways, for the rest of our life and for the rest of our life. Jesus wants us to exchange our weary life for his abundant life for the, for the rest of our lives. Now, he says some things here. Number one, he says his yoke is easy. Now, let me tell you what that word easy denotes. It, it denotes the idea that it fits just right. His yoke is custom made. Now, I want to tell you, when it comes to the yoke, Jesus' yoke fits. But not all other yokes fit. One size doesn't fit all out there, but his is custom made just for you. Uh, the, and, and the yoke was designed to help oxen pull easier and more effectively. That's why they yoked them together, that, because together they could accomplish more. They could be more effective. It was easier for them, but they had to have the right size yoke on. And so the fit was important. Because if the, the yoke didn't fit correctly or it was too large, it would rub the flesh raw on the oxen. It would make blisters and sores on them, which would, as you would imagine, would, would affect their performance. The whole idea here of being heavy laden and beat down is because of the wrong sized yoke around our neck. Does that make sense? That's the idea. That's why he, he says, essentially, give me yours and take mine because mine fits the one you're wearing, the stresses, the strains, the pressures of living in a fallen world are, are, don't fit, and they're going to wear you out. Do you get it? Y'all get it? Wearing the yoke of the world will wear you out. It'll create blisters. It'll cause sores in your heart and in your mind. And so the yoke is easy, Jesus says. But he also says his yoke provides rest. It provides rest. Remember, the yoke was going to make the oxen's work easier. So the yoke of Christ makes our work and service easier. And it brings rest to our soul. In fact, under the, the yoke of Christ, you're not going to go, i got to get out from under this. But in the world, you're always thinking, how can I get around this? How can I get out from under these stresses and pressures? But when you have the yoke of, because it fits perfectly, it helps you, it aids you in the work that you do. I, I wonder today, are you watching us on television, live audience, do you need rest? You will grow weary and you will stay weary if you walk under the wrong yoke. But you don't have to do that. Look, you can labor under the beatdown of the world's yoke, or you can labor under the restful, right-fitting yoke of Christ, but it's really up to you. So, like his command, come, come to me. It's also a command to take from him. Literally in the Greek. When he says come, that's in the imperative. It's a command, come to me. When he says, take my yoke, guess what? Did you know that's a command? It's an imperative. Come to me. That's the first step. And then take my yoke. That's the second. It's your decision. And it determines, it determines whether you become a full follower of Christ. When I was preparing this message, uh, I thought about Caravaggio's Renaissance painting, the Call of Matthew, St. Matthew. And you can go look it up. It's a beautiful Renaissance uh, painting. And I, I thought about it, and I hadn't looked at it in years, so I went back and I, I looked at it again. And, and um, the painting captures the decisive moment for Matthew when Jesus is calling him to follow him. And on the left side of the painting, Matthew sits at a table. He's counting his money that he's earned from his work as a tax collector, and he's dressed in all these fine uh, quality clothes. And he's surrounded by four assistants. And in the shadows on the right side of the painting is Jesus. And Jesus is pointing at Matthew. 
and he's calling, to, uh, calling him to follow him. But interestingly in the painting, Jesus is pointing at Matthew, calling Matthew, but Jesus' feet are already turned uh, to go. He says, Matthew, you come follow me. Matthew has no time uh, in the painting. to he, he has no time to ponder his options. And with this coin still on the table in front of him, he, he has this look of surprise on his face in the painting and uh, this gesture as if to say, me? Who, me? Now, we know the story, don't we? We know that Ma- Matthew said yes, that he left whatever he was doing, and he followed Jesus. We don't know if it played out exactly like that painting did, but it captures that moment where Jesus says, you, Matthew, you come on and follow me. You know, that's the same invitation that you and I have from Jesus. You. Come on, follow me. That's what Jesus says. That decisive moment for Matthew was the moment that changed his life. It was the invitation of Christ to follow him and find rest that the world could never offer him. And today, this is a decisive moment for you and for me. Christ is calling you. He's calling you. And he says, come to me, all of you, come to me. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, it means to show up. To RSVP, here I am. It means to give up. Lord, all that I am, all that I have, I surrender to your control. And it means to take up. It it means to, to take up his yoke. It fits. It works. It means to exchange our life and the burdens of our life for his life. Now, you say, well, I'm already a believer. Well, you may be a believer, but you are just as tired and just as weary as a person who has never come to Jesus. And Jesus is calling to you as well. What is his message to you? His message is, give up control of your life. A lot of Christians are weary because they haven't given up control. Give up your burdens. What burdens are you carrying that, that have, you have no business carrying? Give them up. Give up the unfitting yoke of the world and take up the easy yoke of Christ. And then he says, and then discover my rest. Discover by wearing my yoke that I am the source of life. I am the source of rest. I am the one who restores your soul. Show up. Give up. Take up. Father, I pray for those who are watching, those in this live audience, and those that will watch that are burdened and weary. Some are carrying loads that they don't even realize. They've just become so accustomed to carrying the loads that they don't even realize. Would you help them to see honestly that they're carrying burdens that you don't want them to carry? And Father, would you protect their hearts and their minds from believing the lie of hell that they can control their life better than you can? Or being afraid to really say, God, here I am, and here's all of me, and here's all that I am, and all that I have, and I lay myself before you. And Father, help them to take up the burden that's light, the yoke of Christ, and find the rest for their souls. Father, there are some watching this. There are some in this room this morning who've never called on you.
You've called to them. You're calling right now. Would you cause them to hear your voice? Right now, would you cause them to call out in return? I hear you, Lord. I hear you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. And cause them to call on you to be their Savior. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You cry out to Him right now. Lord Jesus, I'm tired of bearing the wrong yoke. I'm tired of carrying my burdens. I'm bringing them to You. I'm bringing myself to You. I invite You to come into my life. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need You. I know that You died for me. Come into my life right now. Forgive me of my sins. Become my Savior, my Master. There are others, and you've done that. You've called on Him. You've trusted Him. But you need to call out to Him and say, God, I'm coming back to You. I've been walking down this road under the the wrong yoke. I've been bearing the wrong burden. I I don't know how I even took it back over, but I have. And and Lord, I give up control to You anew. I, I ask You to refresh my soul and bring the rest of Uh, uh, to my soul from wearing your yoke right now. Father, I surrender afresh to follow you, to be a fully committed follower of you. Now, Lord, would you hear these prayers? We pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me for our invitation? I want to invite you to slip out. uh, I want you to uh, balcony or ground floor and come to this altar. Maybe you need to kneel and pray. Come on, if you want, go ahead and start. Staff members are going to be on the aisles. There's a decision for you. He is calling to you. Are you going to RSVP this morning? Whatever it may be. Maybe you need to join the church. That may be his call, a part of his call to you. You know Christ, but you need a family. You come and say, I want Ridgecrest to be my family, my church family, my church. This is the body I want to connect with. You may need to be baptized. You may, uh, you, you may have prayed that prayer, calling on Jesus to be your Savior. Whatever it is, balcony, ground floor, those of you who are viewing us, you, you've made one of those decisions this morning. Why don't you text us? Text us the, the word pastor if you called on Christ to be your Savior or the word baptized if you say, I need to follow up with baptism or I'd like to join. Text those words to the number 334-384. 8080. We'll take it from there. You can do that here. You can use the tear off panel, whatever it may be. But I invite you this morning to come forward, kneel before him. You want to just pray? Come and use this altar. Don't miss this moment. As Brother Tim and the choir leaders, right now, you come on. Come on.